Hello and welcome back. I've been told we're just going to begin since this is uh, part two of our panel here in the auditorium. There will be no formal from the podium introduction, so I'll handle that from here. Hi, my name is John Molesky. I'll serve as your moderator during this discussion of Global Hotspots, a security roundup. And the reality is we have at least four panels in one for you today. But something I want to say about this before we actually dive into the subject matter is whether you're joining us in the room or joining us via the webcast, uh, and whenever you're reading a newspaper or an article or attending an event like this, it's all about value, right, for your time. You want to make sure you've made a good investment and that what you get is worth your, the hour of your life. Well, I can guarantee you this will be the case today. This is a powerhouse group that is sitting next to me, really extraordinary experts whose deep knowledge of the subject matter is enhanced by their deep knowledge of the countries from their time spent on the ground. I mean, this isn't just expertise from afar. These people know their subject matter from the inside out. Cindy Arnson, for example, from your left to right, who will be talking about Venezuela as director of the Wilson Center's Latin American program, which happens to be our second oldest program in its 42nd year, celebrated its 40th anniversary a couple years ago. And Cindy has been with the program for more than 20 years. And she spent significant time on the ground throughout the region, interacting with everyone from heads of state to leaders in the business community to heads of NGOs to ordinary citizens. And so she brings a deep and broad perspective to the discussion. Jean Lee, the director of the Hyundai Motor Korea Foundation Center for Korean History and Public Policy, has the unique distinction that in 2011, she became the first American reporter granted extensive access to North Korea, and that culminated in January of 2012 with her opening the Associated Press's Pyongyang Bureau, the only Western text photo news bureau based in the North Korean capital. And then Robin Wright, any discussion of, uh, well, I should give you her official credentials first, USIP and Wilson Center Distinguished Fellow, but any short list of reporters who have covered the most countries on the planet uh, be might begin and end with Robin Wright. Or certainly, she is on any short list. 140 con countries, six continents. It's somewhat dazzling. And I, seven now, seven. She's up the number. And if we add a continent, she'll get the, she'll get there too. And I, I've told Robin this privately multiple times, and now I get to say it publicly. I, I sit in wonder of your. Uh, productivity, and it's amazing to watch. I don't know how she does it. I suspect that there's not a lot of sleep involved, but she is uh, really a dynamo. And so please help me welcome the panel. So we, we were discussing in advance the fact that we are really a collection of topics rather than one broad topic, but I want to at least begin with a general question uh, for a brief answers from each that sort of bind us together. And it's this, there's a problem that all governments have either had or have been accused of at one time or another, which is sort of the, I characterize it as the walk and chew gum problem, or maybe a more modern designation would be multitasking. Can a nation, when dealing with major issues around the globe, does it have the capacity in its international relations infrastructure, whether that be on the civilian side or the military side, to adequately address the challenge it faces? So what I want to ask is each of our panelists from their particular area of expertise that they're going to be speaking about today to address that question. Is the United States focused enough on the area and are enough resources in play? Let's start with you, Robin. We'll go crazy, and instead of going left to right, we'll go right to left. Uh, the answer to your question is no and no. Uh, <laughs> the United States, under the Trump administration, has taken a very firm stand in saying that it wants to withdraw troops from uh, the Middle East. Uh, it doesn't want to engage uh, with a country like Iran on a nuclear deal. Uh, one of the questions in my mind has always been, where is the set of values that defines the common denominators here? Because they certainly often appear to be uh, in conflict. You have uh, the administration going for a nuclear deal with North Korea, that if it could get anything close to what the nuclear deal with Iran looks like, they'd be very lucky, and there's no way they're going to get that. And yet we're walking away from uh, the historic agreement uh, brokered with six, uh, the world's six major powers. So um, one of the top State Department officials made a very helpful comment to me in describing the administration's definition of national security and foreign policy. 
And that is, unlike earlier presidents that who looked out at the world and say, where are our national security threats, be it China or Russia or ISIS, that this administration defines national security as everything that's within our borders and everything outside it, it really wants to distance itself from. And um, so since we've asked been to be brief in this first round, I'll leave it there. Okay, okay, Jean. So North Korea has been somewhat lucky in the sense that it has been a foreign policy priority for President Trump since he was campaigning. And actually the North Koreans have looked at this as a golden opportunity. Uh, and and we are now in a phase where we had these two summits, the one in Singapore, very dramatic, uh, and then the one in Hanoi just exactly a month ago that fizzled. I mean, I, I have to say I woke up uh, intending to watch this press conference about what I thought would be a dramatic announcement about some deal or some breakthrough, and actually it had all fizzled out with President Trump walking out before they had come to any kind of agreement. Uh, and what I'm concerned about now is that the North Koreans are going to be very impatient to get those talks back on track. Despite what they say, they are going to be impatient to get those talks back on track. But there are signs from President Trump that he is willing to engage in, ironically, some sort of strategic patience and let that issue sit for a bit. I think one of his responses was, well, let's see where things are next year. Mm -hmm. That is going to make the North Koreans very nervous. And I think we are, understandably, one month out, one month after Hanoi, in a kind of face-saving, cooling-off period. But what we're doing now is waiting to see, are we going to get back? Are these two um, negotiating teams going to get back to uh, diplomacy quite quickly? Or are we going to head toward another resumption of provocation? Because the North Koreans know that the best way to get the attention, if you're not at the top of the foreign policy radar, is, is a provocation. Yeah, I guess that works. Poke anybody with a stick and they'll pay attention to you. Cindy. Sure, I, I think that um, Venezuela has been the subject of unprecedented attention by the most senior levels of the US government for several months. President Trump, Vice President Pence, Secretary of State Pompeo, National Security Advisor John Bolton, um, down down the line, um, calling essentially and trying to produce regime change um, in in Venezuela, and all of this has really kind of increased since January of twenty uh, January twenty third of this year when. Um, uh, a, a member of the National Assembly, which was democratically elected in 2015, um, became interim president of the country. Um, this was a man who essentially came out of nowhere that few people outside of Venezuela had ever heard of. Um, the United States quickly recognized this man, Juan Guaido, as the legitimate president um, of Venezuela, and 54 countries now in total recognize Guaido as the government of, of Venezuela. So there was a sense that this would all happen very quickly, that there could be uh, extremely intense pressure on uh, the Maduro government, um, and this would lead to cracks in the armed forces. This was the logic of trying to deliver massive amounts of humanitarian aid uh, in February, and um, it has not had that effect. The United States, um, beginning with the Obama administration and the placing of individual sanctions on Venezuelan officials and members of the military who were um, responsible for repression or deeply involved in corruption, they had been subject to individual sanctions. And those gradually ex um, escalated financial sanctions and then finally oil sanctions um, that uh, if for an economy that depends for about more than 90 percent of its foreign exchange on one single export, that is absolutely catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And I think just in the past week, um, Venezuela's oil shipments to the United States are officially at zero. There was kind of a winding down period. So we are going to see, I think, a much bigger bite. Are there enough resources? My sense is there's high level political attention. I have a lot of questions about whether or not it will be sustained over a long enough period of time. Um, and then the assistance that we are giving to Venezuela's neighbors to absorb um, 3.4 million refugees, the bulk of them uh, who have fled Venezuela since 2015 is really a drop of the bucket. I mean, it's significant in terms of what the United States is providing now 
uh, for foreign aid, but it is nowhere near what you raise what another needs. important aspect of this is not just whether you're paying attention, but whether you have staying power, whether you can have a sustained effort. So what we're going to do now is uh, that more traditional, we'll have each of our panelists provide you with a two to three minute briefing on the uh, things they're prepared to talk about today. And it's as a setup to when we get to your questions. And I'm not going to keep a real strict clock. But if I were, Robin would get extra time because she has a couple of areas to cover, not just <laughs> right. one. Robin, could we begin with you? Sure. Uh, I've just come back from two weeks in Syria and Iraq. I was on the front line in the, for the last battle against ISIS down at a place called Baghouz. Uh, I also toured the entire former caliphate, uh, and it was kind of electrifying. I went to uh, a prison, uh, which had been, it's one of what they call the pop-up prisons that are absorbing the ISIS fighters who've been captured. Nobody estimated the numbers that came out at the end, just stunning. Uh, as the local commander said to me, the U.S. intelligence, all those planes in the sky, fought tracking who was around, and we had no idea how large the ISIS community was. Um, the prison I uh, visited had 1,500 fighters, some of them foreign. I interviewed an American, uh, a Turk. Anna Moroccan, who was the emir of morality, and described how he had taken 14 Yazidi women, put them in a cage, and burned them alive. Mm. Um, uh, what was shocking to me is that the local force, the Syrian Democratic Forces, a scrappy militia, which is just like the United States operating in defiance of the Syrian government, uh, has been stuck with trying to imprison, take care of all of these fighters. And so they've built these little facilities. Uh, this particular facility was filled up in four days. And there were between 40 and 50 people per cell crammed together. And it was it reminded me of Abu Ghraib and Egypt's prisons that have produced, uh, in the case of Abu Ghraib and Bukha in Iraq, produced Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who was the founder, of course, of ISIS. Um, uh, Egypt's prisons produced Islamic Jihad and the militant wing of, um, of the Muslim Brotherhood. So that's one dimension that it has to, uh, to deal with. And, uh, then there is this huge wave of humanity that came out. In December, the displaced persons camp, people who came out of ISIS territory, was 10,000. When I visited in mid-March, it was 70,000. And it was total chaos. They uh, trying to provide tents for these, the wives and widows and the children of all the ISIS fighters. They were separated. The men went to prison. The women went to the, this detention facility. And what are they going to do with all these people? Um, the, the local militia, the SDF, has no ability to hold them, try them long term. They don't have the evidence. They want the countries to take them back, whether it's the foreign fighters or their families. And, and needless to say, a lot of foreign governments don't want to. Some of them don't have the capability Sorry, somebody's at my front door. Um, <laughs> I have a security system. This message brought to you by Home Security <laughs> Systems. Uh, so anyway, they, they, this huge wave of uh, the, you know the post ISIS phenomenon. What do you do with them? And um, there's no governments don't have the evidence to try a lot of these people. And if they came, if they did take them and put them in their prisons, the great fear is they'd infect. Uh, the prisons at, in their home country. So what happens to this enormous uh, post-ISIS <coughs> phenomena? And in many ways, the biggest challenge for the winners are dealing with the losers and making sure that they don't regroup, revive, come back in a new form of ISIS, which almost everyone predicts that they will. The commander, um, I spent time with him, General Maslum, uh, talked about that there were thousands of sleeper cells, and that's the big challenge now. Um, uh, as his aide-de-camp said, we have been fighting two battles. The first one, the military one, we have won. The second one, the war on mentality, we're only beginning to fight. And so when you look out at the celebration of the end of ISIS, it is a major accomplishment. Many people believe it is the most successful, unconventional military campaign ever waged by the U.S. military totally unlike the campaign in Iraq, uh, where we had a 
government ally, uh, worked with a conventional army, had parliamentary approval to be deployed there, had a headquarters for the 74 nations in the international coalition in, in Syria with small teams of special forces working with this scrappy militia uh, of Kurds and tribal Arabs who had vintage equipment you know, it, that, that they won it all is in many ways uh, a miracle. It's a, it'll be studied for decades to come as one of the most successful lessons in counterterrorism. But the problem then is you don't have a government to deal with the aftermath, to absorb these people, to provide the funds. The, the Kurds are not paying their fighters in Syria so that they can buy food for um, the fighters, the ISIS fighters they've captured. I have a lot more to say and I, I, I don't want to take away from others, but um, it's an extraordinary moment. The challenges are huge, and the fact is the United States is now withdrawing, and in many ways we're abandoning a force that has been incredibly successful, has stuck with us, and we were the ones who asked them to wage this war, to go beyond their own little turf, to go in deep inside Syria, to retake a third of the country, um, and they succeeded, and every time we asked for something, they did it, and now we're walking away. Thank you, Robin. Now we hop on our virtual plane and we head to the Korean Peninsula. Can I just say, first of all, how proud I am. We've got a <laughs> panel of three women up here, okay. led by uh, our indomitable leader. I apologize for dragging things no. down. <laughs> You're giving us a little bit of diversity. We've got a little gender diversity, but I just, I think it's very, <laughs> it's notable because I think um, almost every other think tank or every other event I've been to when you have a topic like this, it's all men, especially when it comes to... I'm people. very in very touch proud. with my feminine side. I was, <laughs> like Tarzan was raised by apes. I was raised by a working mother and I so I feel like I... Fantastic. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, enough silliness. Jean, back no, to you. No, I just, I just, it's something that I notice, especially in the Korea context, yeah. and I'm very proud of the Wilson Center for Champ. Absolutely. And hopefully we'll get to a point where we don't have to point these things out, but we're no. not quite there yet, so I just want to mention it. Uh, but um, yes, so I set the stage on um, where we are diplomatically, but I think since I'm one of the few people who spent so much time in North Korea, what I want to do is present you with a little bit more of a picture of what it's like inside the country since so few of us have the, t the chance to go. Right now we have a State Department travel ban that prohibits most of us. Um, from visiting North Korea. Has anyone in the in the room ever been to North Korea? Oh. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, only the women. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I but I think that's the context that I would like to provide, and that's certainly one of the things we do in our program is try to provide the look, as you mentioned, from the inside out, and that's often missing. Um, I think that for so many Americans, the uh, We've, of course, been watching this for years, but it started with the fire and fury of 2017 uh, with President Trump engaging with directly with the leader of North Korea in this war of words. And this um, heightened rhetoric and leading to protracted and heightened uh, acceleration of their testing of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. And, and then, of course, we saw in 2018 the shift when Kim Jong-un decided that he was done testing and he was going to turn to diplomacy. And so then we had this somewhat remarkable uh, stepping out onto the international stage. And I would say he moved into this phase of trying to project himself as a normal leader of, well, we can't call it a normal country, but the normalization of his image. And what I want to do is just remind you that this remains a country that is desperately poor. We all know that, but you don't often get to see it. And, and I want to provide that perspective. 40% of the population has trouble getting food on the table. Millions of people can't get up food on the table. We may see images of Pyongyang, and it's, it looks fairly modern from the pictures that not only the state media put out, but also that foreign journalists get. But I can tell you from having lived there that even in the most um, well-heeled corridors, the most modern of buildings, you still often don't have running water or electricity or power. So it's, I just mentioned this not to um, humiliate North Korea, which is how they often see this kind of characterization, but to really give you a sense for how dire their situation is. You know, I was just walking in here, and I say this all every time I'm up here how cold it is, but, and I always, always want to mention that when you're, if you're sitting here and you're cold, imagine just how cold it is in a country that is far more north of the equator than we are and doesn't have any heat.
Um, and I mentioned this partly because it will help you understand just how desperate and how impatient Kim Jong-un will be to come to some sort of agreement with the United States, uh, despite what they say. And they're, they're going to be acting tough, but when it comes down to it, if, he, if this young man wants to rule into his old age, he's in his 30s right now, he's got to put his country on a better path economically. He knows that they can't survive with these sanctions in place. Uh, so if you take a step back and sort of look at things, at the, look at the bigger picture of things, he is going to try to find a way to come back. And as I said earlier, is he going to take the diplomatic path? Or is he going to revert back to using provocation to get the attention that he feels that he needs in order to get President Trump to that table. Um, and so that's a little bit of the context that we don't get to see and that I wanted to provide for you is that North Korea is actually in a very desperate situation. That also will help you understand just how valuable the nuclear program is. He's not going to give that up easily. He's going to sell pieces off of it, pieces of it off at a very high price. And so we have to be realistic about what, the, about what that nuclear program means for him his own stability, his country's future, and be very, and understand that what that means to him and how much, how valuable it is to him. And take that into consideration as we, as we negotiate with him and try to figure out how we make the world a safer place. Um, I do, I'm perhaps, you know, I'm perhaps um, not quite as uh, pessimistic as, as some of my fellow analysts will be because I do understand just how desperate the Koreans are, the North Koreans, I should say, actually the South Koreans as well. We have to remember that I just got back from a couple weeks in South Korea and um, can tell you that right now they're much more concerned about their pollution than they are the threat from North Korea. But because they have their own issues when it comes to um, pollution, when it comes to their economy, that they are quite impatient with how much attention their own president is devoting to this issue of North Korea. And then they are also going to be very impatient for some sort of change to happen um, in the near future. So that's a little bit of the context that I wanted to provide for you, the look from the inside out. Uh, and, um, and I'm sure we'll have some questions related to that. Yes. Too. Jean, thank you. Thanks. Cindy. Uh, Jean's comments about the extreme poverty in North Korea, I think, is a good segue to highlight a couple, just a few um, statistics from that demonstrate the depth of Venezuela's economic and humanitarian <coughs> crisis. Gross domestic product has shrunk by nearly half in five years. That's a period roughly corresponding to when Nicolás Maduro took power in 2013. The output of the oil industry has dropped by two-thirds. And inflation last year, according to the IMF, was a million percent. And if people have a hard time, I have a hard time comprehending what that means, the IMF predicts it will be 10 million percent this year, which means that the money is essentially worthless. It's a barter economy. Um, people who can get access to dollars um, try to. That crisis is accompanied by a collapse of the health system um, and the, uh, the impetus for millions of people to have um, fled Venezuela. And let me just give you a couple of figures. We're talking about an average of 5,000 people a day going mostly to other countries of the region. Again, the overwhelming majority since 2015. Colombia alone, Jane's been to Colombia, has 1.1 million documented Colombians, approximately a million more expected to arrive this year. Um, Peru has 506,000, Chile 288,000, Ecuador 221,000. These are developing countries. These are countries that already face difficulties with unemployment, underemployment, informality, poverty, the poor quality of the health and education system and other public services, how they are expected to absorb these refugees, um, which they have done with enormous generosity and grace over these last years because Venezuela for many years was a place where other people went for political refuge, um, it's, it's, um, it's simply not sustainable. And my fear, and perhaps others in the audience who are more conversant with what the migration crisis in Europe um, has meant for the politics of those countries, my concern over the medium term is that this is going to dramatically change the politics in the region um, and lead to greater xenophobia. I mean, there are a long history of different forms of populism um, in Latin America, but lead to a harder, more right-wing, anti-immigrant um, populism. 
The United States um, has not accepted uh, Venezuelan new Venezuelan refugees into this country. There is a bipartisan effort in both the House and the Senate to grant what is known as temporary protected status to Venezuelans, which essentially says to Venezuelans who are already in the United States, we are not going to deport you even if you're undocumented. But that doesn't do anything for the number of people. So you have a, um, a this kind of um, dichotomous situation where, on the one hand, we're calling for all of this pressure and squeezing of the Venezuelan economy in order, hopefully, to produce regime change. At the same time, we are not, as a country, doing our part and leading by example to help the region um, absorb these refugees. I'll end with just sort of a, um, a brief comment about, um, about military intervention, because any number of senior U.S. officials from Trump on down have tried to maintain a certain sort of psychological drama around the issue of, you know, all options being on the table, not ruling out um, a military option to, redu to remove Maduro. Um, and I would say that that is a very popular idea in ve within Venezuela and also within Colombia, the country that has received the most, um, the most uh, migrants. I personally think it would be a disaster. There are active ELN Colombian guerrillas in the thousands that are in Venezuelan territory. There are members of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia that signed this peace accord with the previous government in Colombia, about 1,500, 2,000 who have not demobilized, some of them also in Venezuela. Um, any number of FARC combatants who did demobilize, who are not really getting much support as they try to go on with their lives, all of these people, I think, would just welcome a chance to take up arms and fight the Yankee uh, invaders. And so what you would have is a regionalization of the conflict. You also have um, armed militias, thugs, really, in Venezuela that have been armed and created first by Hugo Chavez, now by Maduro, um, who are very good at killing uh, innocent people and unarmed demonstrators, but uh, and who therefore you know are not battle hardened and have never really been in combat, but could wage um, an extensively uh, a prolonged urban dirty guerrilla war against any occupation force. So I um, I'm not a fan of military intervention. So the question is, what is the answer? Um, and I think that as the sanctions really bite and make it much more difficult for Maduro to share the spoils of government with the top levels of the military hierarchy. Um, there needs to be the flexibility to talk to people, to provide off-ramps, to say not everybody who joins in support of a democratic transition will wind up behind bars or in a supermax in the United States. Those kinds of compromises are, are almost, you know, um, heresy, uh, given, given the depredations um, of this government, but I, I think um, may become uh, at, at some point um, an option that we need to pursue. Robin, you uh, I want to add something very quickly, and it, it goes back to your first question, and it ties the three issues together. Um, when you talk about the the humanitarian crisis, I mean, Syria for a long time was the world's greatest humanitarian crisis, rivaled now only by Yemen. And you're talking about a country with Syria where 22 million people, where 5 million, more than 5 million, are refugees in other countries, destabilizing neighbors. Little Lebanon has taken it with a population of 4 million has taken in over one million. Can you imagine if we tried to take in a quarter of the size of our population as immigrants? Uh, and uh, more than 60 percent of the population is dependent on international aid for their daily bread. The devastation in Syria now totals more than uh, 400 billion dollars. I mean, we're talking, and the rippling effect of immigration on Europe, as as Cindy mentioned, that that this, the striking thing about all these three conflicts is that they're, they're all spreading, rippling across borders, across regions, and nobody's kind of factoring that in into, you know, we're, we're thinking in terms of, well, let's build a wall and we'll contain the problem, when in fact there is no unity of vision and that there's uh, this very common problem because you can't solve a political problem or a conflict unless you really deal with the economic realities. One of the things that was most striking about talking to the, the 
there's actually a rehabilitation program in Syria, believe it or not, where they're taking ISIS fighters, giving them a rehabilitation program, integrating back in the tribes that provided them. You know, I say good luck with that. Um, uh, but the, I went and, and talked to the sheikhs who were the guarantors of the program, running the program, and the former ISIS fighters who are the graduates of the program. And the common denominator is they don't have jobs. And the prospect of really reintegrating them into society and giving them an alter alternative is zilch. And the United States has walked away from stabilization, money, and so forth. So there's this common, listening to both of you, this stunning commonality between these, these crises where the, the, that you see the, the erosion of societies, the, um, the spreading uh, regionally, globally of these problems in ways that are... Um, I think going to come back to bite us big time. And in many cases, they're young populations, particularly in the, in the Middle East. Uh, absolutely. The, uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask a quick follow-up to each of our panelists. And when I say quick, I'm, I'm sort of fishing for a, a one-minute answer. And then we will turn to you for your questions and comments. And, and Robin, what I want to ask you is, you know, for, for weeks, the headlines globally have been ISIS almost defeated, almost defeated, now defeated. Uh, how defeated are they in the context of what kind of a threat they pose, either militarily or through terrorist activity? And is it possible that a dispersed Islamic State is actually more dangerous than one that was sitting on some land in Syria? It's clearly far harder to fight. And when you have a territory, you have a place that you want to contain fighters you know are deployed. Uh, now that they're underground, tracking them is going to be far harder. And one of the interesting things uh, that I learned uh, is that the, that the ISIS component in Iraq, which was pushed back faster than in Syria, has also revived much faster. It has an infrastructure. It has carried out dozens of attacks now since the liberation of Mosul. Um, and one of the things, again, getting back to this common problem, I went to West Mosul as well uh, as I, in Iraq, which was the, the largest city that ISIS held, um, as well as the territory in Syria. And I've covered every war in the world since the 1973 Middle East War, and I have never, ever, ever seen con d destruction like I saw in West Mosul. I took pictures of it. They are numbing. There's nothing. I mean, there is nothing there that is inhabitable. And unlike Raqqa, which was the capital of ISIS, which is in Syria, and I went there and I took pictures of the little girls, their ponytails uh, flowing, walking to school with their little pink backpacks, that there is a sense of life returning in Syria, in the, this area. We often think, well, Iraq, because it's you know, an ally country or because we, we have a more stable relationship, Syria is kind of uh, its own dynamic, that, that Iraq is the one we can help rebuild and, and so forth. And in many ways, it may be just the reverse, that you see the, this return of life. Um, one of the most interesting things in Raqqa was the, um, the, the industries all along the streets were taking the, the crumpled steel, they look like steel tumbleweed that had been taken from uh, destructed buildings. And the men were with their hammers beating these, uh, these twisted, rusted uh, steel things into long beams for reconstruction. And I drove around the city and you could see the, um, the rebuilding uh, that, that they were being used. It was just everywhere. Whereas in, in Mosul, uh, it, in, especially in Mos West Mosul, it's going to take a decade just to dis destroy what's there in, in order to rebuild it. So, you know, the, 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 one of the big questions is not just the underground cells that are, the sleeper cells that are plotting and planning I IEDs and um, sabotage and assassinations. It's really the environment. Can you create an environment where extremism isn't seen as the only alternative because the government doesn't provide jobs, because the economy is so lousy, uh, because people are displaced and don't have homes? Um, and everywhere I went, I looked at the young, again, as you point out, the, the dominant numbers, and I kept thinking, the second generation, you know, mm -hmm. there they are. Wow. Uh, Gene, I want to ask you about an expectations questions, uh, question. Uh, you mentioned yourself that you had higher expectations for the Vietnam summit, and expectations through this entire ordeal have been built by 
President Moon in South Korea and President Trump in, in the United States and Kim in North Korea and the press coverage. And we seem to think something was going to happen. And now it seems to be the hurry up and wait moment. How should we calibrate our expectations moving forward? Yeah, I mean, actually, I just wanted to go back to your initial question about resources. I would say to expend the time and money that it takes to get over to Vietnam to have a presidential summit in Vietnam, and then just to walk away from it. Uh, and for Kim Jong-un, it was even greater. I mean, he was on the train for 60 hours. He clearly was expecting to do something big. Uh, so they went into this thinking that they were going to get something out of it. And what we saw was a miscalculation on both sides. I, just to, you know, I really think that um, this is what happens when, when you leave it to a leader-to-leader -leader negotiation rather than empowering your officials, your negotiators to do the work for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wrote a blog post for the Wilson Center because I know the North Korean negotiator, the chief negotiator. I brought him to New York uh, to um, negotiate the opening of the AP Bureau. So we know him quite well. And people would ask me, well, you know him. Is he a nice guy? Is he, is he effective? And I said, it doesn't matter whether he's a nice guy. There's only so much he can do. Because the North Koreans will only give him so much leeway, and they're going to leave it up to Kim Jong-un. And that is precisely what they did. And I have to say, in 2011, when I brought him to New York, I did the same thing where I, sh I took him to Wall Street. I was thinking, I'm going to entice him with American commerce and see if he can, if that will get me a bureau in North Korea. Well, actually, it did, so I got a little further than <laughs> <laughs> out President Trump. Uh, but, um, but I think, uh, but you know, uh, but, and it's not to criticize President Trump on that sense, because I do think that we were all hoping that his idiosyncratic, unusual style would get us farther. Mm -hmm. But many of us knew that if you don't do your homework when it comes to North Koreans, you are going to get fleeced. So months, years, what are we talking about as far so as it expectations? Depends on what our expectations are. And for some sort of a deal that would uh, that would seem like so a safer yeah i mean world. i think if we were to be realistic and we were to talk about what many of us here at the wilson center have talked about which is perhaps you need to be realistic and and come up with some sort of freeze and containment deal with the north koreans rather than demanding that they give up their nuclear weapons up front i would love for them to give up their nuclear weapons up front in exchange for economic cons uh, concessions and sanctions lifting sounds like points. you're describing the iran deal Exactly. The, uh, S Cindy, uh, similar question about expectations. You know, r right after this all started to uh, occur, it was uh, l lining up to support Juan Guado and uh, uh, overtures to the military that perhaps maybe it's time for a change. And I think some analysts were, would have said that um, they thought Maduro would have already be on a plane to Moscow if not living in a flat or something like that. Uh, w more staying power than we anticipated? What are we talking about here? Well, the oil sanctions really are only now starting to bite. So there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. There will be more suffering, more hunger. People are talking about actual starvation. Um, we're coming up on the beginning of the Venezuelan agricultural cycle. People don't have seeds, fertilizers to plant. Um, so what little food, something like 20 percent, is produced domestically is not going to be produced. Um, uh, it's going to be a very difficult year economically. And what political effect that will have, we don't know. Um, thus far, uh, the government has become more repressive and has clamped down and called in the Russians. So I'd like to sort of talk about two, what I see as two potential sort of trip wires for more precipitous US action. One would be the arrest, the actual arrest of the interim president, or people say the legitimate president of, of Venezuela, Juan Guaido. Um, I think it, sort of to test the waters, just in this past week, um, Guaido's chief of staff was arrested and it has not been released, has not been charged. And, and I think it was sort of like, huh, huh, to see what the international reaction would be like. Um, the Treasury Department slapped additional sanctions on the Venezuelan Development Bank, but it's um, not, I, mean, I think they were trying to see what would happen. Thus far, they have um, not wanted to touch him or his family, although colectivos I read today were outside his house threatening. Um, so I think that's one thing to watch. Should he be taken prisoner, I think that, that the United States now, given the level of attention, would, would probably uh, 
take strong action. Um, another thing is that two Russian planes with military people arrived in Venezuela over the weekend. There was a senior military uh, officer of, uh, of the Russian army who was there. The Russians claim that this is to service weapon systems, including anti-aircraft weapon systems. Think, you know, an, an air attack from, from the United States. Um, but those kinds of things could become real provocation. Escalation written exactly, all over Exactly, you know. because um, uh, the current view, I think, of the White House is to see quite literally what, what John Bolton has called the troika of tyranny, that Venezuela and Nicaragua and Cuba are all joined, and first you topple Venezuela, and then you get rid of Ortega in, in uh, Nicaragua, and then your ultimate prize is the you know, um, uh, the overturning of the, of the Cuban Revolution. And I think they really see politics in, in, that, in that light. I want to turn to your questions and comments. And what I would ask you to do is uh, identify yourself and be as concise as possible. And please direct your question to one panelist. If we have three people answering every question, uh, we'll get to one question. Right. So, yes, sir. We'll get you, oh, also you'll need a microphone. So once I call on you, it will be quickly delivered right behind you. There you go. Right. Uh, John Scarlett, uh, the last point, Venezuela and the Russians. What are the Russians, do you think, intending to do? How far will they go? It's obviously very symbolic, sending those uh, troops in and that three-star general in. So the signal will appear to be that don't touch Maduro. Correct. Or otherwise, you'll have further trouble from us. So how do you see that? Right. Well... I think that's exactly the message. Was It was a signal to the United States, but it was also a signal to members of the Venezuelan armed forces that might have been thinking about, you know, breaking with the regime. And I should say over a thousand troops have left, but these are low-level people, not the, not the hierarchy. Um, the Wilson Center is blessed with these wonderful regional programs, and so we have taken over the last couple of months really hard looks at Venezuela's relationship with, Venez with, China, uh, with Russia, with China, with India, and Cuba, hopefully next month. Um, so what I know from our colleagues in the Kennan Institute and our Russia scholars is that Venezuela is of great geostrategic value to Putin. Um, is it, it, is, it provides the opportunity to mess around in the U.S. so-called near abroad in the same way that Western powers were seen as interfering in Ukraine and Crimea. It's sort of a tit for tat. Um, Venezuela is, excuse me, Russia is, is limited economically given the state of the economy and how much it can provide. It has sold billions of dollars of weapons. Um, during, particularly during the oil boom years um, under Hugo Chavez, um, and it will provide continued technical support to run those systems. Um, the uh, Russian oil company Rosneft um, has a number of joint ventures and has actually taken over some of the of the uh, state oil company Pedavesa's assets um, because they just were not producing. So there's an economic value, there's a strategic and a military value. Um, I am not sure that uh, that Russia would look to provoke a war with the United States, but I think they are um, intending to show support for the Maduro government and say uh, to the United States that if you are thinking of doing something, um, this could escalate very quickly to a global conflict. So we are back in the battle days of the Cold War. Right here, please. And then let's, uh, if you deliver another microphone back there, we'll have him. Uh, you'll be ready uh, to hi, go, Hi, Eric McClellan. Um, this question is for Robin. So this victory against the caliphate, what will this mean for the Kurdish state and the Kurdish nation as a whole? It's a very good question. You know, the th <sighs> poor Kurds, you know, largest minority in the world that doesn't have a state, century ago we promised them one and, and backed away. Um, the interesting thing is that we asked the Kurds in Syria to go deep into Arab territory when they didn't want to. They wanted to get ISIS out of the Kurdish area in the north and stop there. And in 2017 we really pushed. And the, the Kurdish commander said, I'll go in if you will arm the Arabs I need to recruit Arabs to fight with us. 
And they used to fight, the, the Arabs in that region and the Kurds used to be rivals. And, you know, he had to do a lot of um, homework in, in working with the sheikhs, the elders, to convince them. Uh, and, he, and that's where this rehabilitation program was born. Look, if we capture your people, we'll let you have them back and go through rehabilitation. If you'll provide fighters for us to wage this war, and we did. And they moved into Arab territory, um, did, as one U.S. official told me over the weekend, did everything we asked of them. And in December, in the middle of the battle, uh, uh, President Trump announced that we were going to withdraw before the end of, of the ISIS campaign. And the U.S. intelligence community said the Kurds will stop there. They are not going to move forward without U.S. air power. They're not going to move forward thinking that when we have to hold this territory, the Americans are going to leave. And they went on anyway. And I actually have, the, which I'm writing about, the blow by blow of the video conference that General Votel, the head of CENTCOM, had with the Kurdish commander to tell him that they were going to withdraw. It's a, it's a riveting story. And the question now is, now that they're withdrawing, what happens to the Kurds? And they have done, the, the Kurds in many ways have been the glue, holding these Arab tribes together. They're, di they're divided among themselves. But they did it with the U.S you know, imprimatur. Now that the U.S. is leaving, can the Kurds both hold together that Kurdish-Arab coalition, prevent new tensions? And what do they do in terms of dealing with Syria? While they had the U.S. behind them, they had leverage to deal with Damascus and say, you have to give us autonomy or some kind of rights. You have to protect the Syrian force that waged, that got rid of ISIS and so forth. And now that's all up, uh, that's all in doubt. And so there is so much uncertainty that have we won this major territorial battle, and not only do we face the threat from a revived ISIS because of the, the aftermath and the inability to deal with it, but because of the reality of Syria's complex political environment, does what we built implode and, you know, leave Syria in, whether it's ungovernable or, you know, uh, in one crisis after another or new conflicts among the very people we brought together. The, 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 the combinations are so dire and so worrisome, and we don't seem to care. Hello, uh, Phil Schrafer, retired. This is from Ms. Wright. Uh, given there are Iranians in, uh, in Syria having been busy fighting the uh, Islamic State, given that the leader of Israel considers uh, Iranians an uh, existential threat, and there's a love affair now between our president and the leader of Israel, and that our, our leader in the Department of Defense is a civilian, has no military experience, Mattis is gone. What's the chance that we'll be drawn into a conflict with, for, for further uh, conflict with, with Ira Iran? Uh, you know, I don't think the Iranians want one. I don't think uh, the Trump administration wants one. The problem is we, there's no mechanism to diffuse the tensions. Today we p imposed an, another uh, severe round of sanctions uh, on what we, we believe is a sanctions-busting operation um, in Iran. I think the squeeze is going to continue. I think one of the things that's really striking is that that for all the wishful thinking in Washington, in, uh, at the White House, State Department, about the implosion of the regime, we are not at that point that, whether it's the economic conditions, uh, as in other places, or the uh, anger at the regime has reached the point that we're going to see a green movement that explodes and actually has some impact politically. Um, but it is very hard to see you know, if we have another six years of this policy, whether Iran, Iran, Iran does have an election in two years, the current president, because of term limits, can't run again. He was the one that broke, ran originally on doing a, a nuclear deal. So who is put forward? During that period, we're also likely to see a transition uh, with the, the supreme leader is, you know, um, is a senior citizen, although, as I like to point out, he's only a year older than Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> um, uh, that, that beard is, uh, uh, you know, makes him, gives him, a, adds age. Uh, but we are likely to see real big transitions in Iran, and in a way that we might have, 
kind of nudged it in one direction by saying you can engage with the world and so forth. We, we may be pushing the, a paranoid regime already in another direction because it sees that as the only way to survive in a... Uh, uh, so I don't worry as much about a war. I think it's, a, um, it's, you know, it's on the table in a way it wasn't during the, the nuclear deal. Uh, I don't think either side wants it. The question is, can you see the, the nuclear deal survive and the Iranians continue to honor it? What difference can the Europeans make in giving them the incentives to stay on board? Um, uh, and what happens politically? And there are, I think, a lot of other things that are, are really worrisome, too. Congresswoman Harmon. Yeah. Well, I've been listening intently to this almost all female panel uh, <laughs> in the Wilson Center, which is majority female. Just point that out. Uh, and it, it, the insights are amazing. One word that has not been mentioned once is spelled C O N G R E S S. And it used to be back in the day that Congress played a role in foreign policy. Uh, for good or bad, there is some conversation about passing an authorization to use to not use military force in Yemen, which has some legs. There also are a few people, uh, Marco Rubio is one, uh, making a lot of noise about Venezuela and actually going down there. Um, my question is, um, is there a role at this point that Congress, if bipartisanship or even uh, energy to focus on things other than the Mueller report broke out. Is there a role that Congress could play that would be constructive in any of the areas you're addressing? And we, uh, with your impeccable timing, Jane, you have, we have three minutes left in the session. We have three panelists, so that's perfect. Cindy, let's begin with you. Sure. Um, Venezuela has been a bipartisan issue in the Congress. Um, there is a uh, bipartisan condemnation of the Maduro government, um, a uh, bipartisan embrace of President Guaido, um, and a desire to see uh, a free election and democracy in, in Venezuela. I think where people start to differ is over the desirability of U.S. military involvement, and I think that kind of breaks down, not entirely, but to a certain extent along Republican versus Democratic lines. The hawks tend to be uh, in the Republican Party and in the White House, people who um, think that, they're, that the only way to produce uh, regime change in Venezuela is through the use of military force, predominantly by the United States. Um, does not seem that any Latin American country is willing to join that. Um, and that's an area where the, um, where the Democrats, I think, break rank. Um, there's also, I think, um, an appreciation of the extent of the refugee crisis, the need for the United States to do more. Um, there is a bipartisan bill in the Senate and the House to grant TPS. Uh, whether it would be vetoed by the White House, it has certainly up until now been opposed by the White House because people say that it's just inconsistent with the policy that the United States has been taking on migration more generally. So how can Venezuela be uh, an exception without being accused of um, uh, you know, double standards? Um, so I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of ways in which people are working together on this. Um, my personal hope is that there will be um, bipartisan support for a depoliticization of the humanitarian aid. That has been, um, I think, seen as a tool that will support Juan Guaido, bring people to his side, um, and that's not the way humanitarian aid needs to be delivered. Jean Lee. Uh, I'm actually very curious to hear what you have to say yeah. on this particular issue because you have been to North Korea. Did you want to share, or? Should we get a microphone back for you? <laughs> I, I, Pass. I would say, though, that uh, congressional members have a very important role to play right now. So much of this negotiation has been at the leader-to-leader -leader level, uh, and it has been members who have been very good about bring, bring, reminding us that the context is important. Some of these other issues, looking very closely at sanctions, the effective, effective, uh, effectiveness of sanctions, and also the risk of uh, waivers or exemptions, and um, the importance of sanctions as a tool in diplomacy. Also calling attention to some of the human rights issues that remain 
a question when it comes to dealing with North Korea. Those have not been a part of the leader to leader dialogue. So it's been very good that we've had some members continue to raise those points. Uh, and certainly uh, in reaching out to members in the region or our partners in the region who feel very left out of this leader to leader process, Japan, South Korea, uh, and making sure that they remain, um, that they feel that Washington is still committed. Uh, if it's even if it's Congress and not the president to maintaining those relationships and keeping their interests in in mind. Robin. Well, I, I was going to say the same thing. I'd much rather hear what Jane has to say. But um, <laughs> on Syria, it's striking that people like John McCain and Lindsey Graham actually went to the area where U.S. special forces were working with a, a this Kurdish-dominated militia. And, but you have no sense that in Congress there's an interest in dealing with the post-ISIS environment. They really, um, there's a, you know, a sentiment, well, we're gonna let the UN deal with the political component and, well, ISIS is beaten, hallelujah, let's move on. Um, when Trump saw in the Washington Post that the US was providing $200 million in stabilization for Syria, he turned around and said, we've got to cancel that. And the thing that worries me the most is there is no focus on the Hill in stabilization, reconstruction, and dealing with all the very questions that led to the rise of ISIS and extremism in the very first place. So uh, Congress does have a role. I don't think it has a will. I don't think it has an interest. Um, uh, you know, it, it spends so much time dealing with this wall question and not with the kind of the big picture issues, the, um, the human component of foreign policy. We tend to see, particularly because we're so separate from most of the world, that it's a problem over there and the further away we are from it, uh, the better. And that really concerns me, our own, uh, whether it's our national ignorance or the level of education we have about the world and the fact that there's not the component that pressures Congress into paying attention either. Um, that as a, as a result, we've there's a huge vacuum out there. And again, what's going to happen 10 and 20 years when we're talking about the very same issues of <laughs> extremism and beating back movements and um, areas that have been destroyed and there's still no hope of, of creating an alternative uh, it worries me a lot. We're, we're almost out of, we're out of time, so Cindy, quickly. Really quickly, this is an incredibly important issue in certain congressional districts in Florida, and it's not lost on politicians, both Rubio and Bolton and, and a lot of others who are addressing the concerns of Venezuelan Americans and Cuban Americans in Florida. Um, there is an enormous domestic constituency in that part of the country for Venezuela. A couple of quick thank yous. For those of you in the room, thank you for being with us today. Those of you joining us online, we hope you enjoyed what you saw today. There's plenty more where it came from, and if you didn't, shame on you. Stay in touch with us, wilsoncenter.org, Twitter, Facebook. We have lots to offer, and I hope you'll join us again. Uh, uh, and finally, I want to save our final thanks for this amazing panel. Uh, we were talking earlier Earlier about woman power here at the at the Wilson Center. You know, DC has Wonder Woman and Marvel has Captain Marvel. And now I'm going to add Jane to this panel because we have the Fantastic Four. <laughs> so please thank me and or join me in thanking them.